Okay, everybody, welcome back, um, or welcome if you just join us here for the second session now. In the morning, we have been discussing in our first session sustainability, and as I said, now in our second session, we are going to discuss trust and security. And we all know that with uh, the digitization of our societies, of course, trust and security has become really a very, very hot topic. And in particular, when we look at uh, postal operators, uh, then we see actually uh, how important trust and security has become because all the operators have been transforming massively over the past few decades and there is a lot, a lot of data around and a lot of data exchanged, so a lot of data that needs to be secured. But the situation that we are facing is, of course, that the data or your own data to secure your own data is sometimes not enough simply because you have to deal with so many other stakeholders. That can be other postal operators, that can be other stakeholders like suppliers, that can go all platforms such as the one of the UPU or other platforms. So in the end, it's not anymore only in your own domain where you have to secure the data. It is also in the domains of others. So because that's the very particularity of, uh, of the postal system, it's one big postal network. And actually, as it is so often the case, uh, it is only as strong and as secure as its weakest link. So collaboration is, of course, key. And I would like now to introduce the three panelists that are joining me here on the stage uh, to, to talk about exactly this, trust and security within the postal uh, ecosystem. We have Dr. Sifundo uh, Givmoyo, he's the Secretary General of the Pan-African Postal Union. We have uh, Chavez uh, Josefia, he's the Chief Executive Officer of CPOST International, and Sid Hart, he is the Managing Director of the Asia Pacific Post Cooperative. And I would now like to ask uh, Givmoyo to go to the lectern and, uh, and tell us a bit about uh, the Pan-African Postal Union and also your work that you are doing for your members to drive trust and security. Thank you very much uh, for having me in this um, show. It is a show. Like you said, I have to come here and give a lecture. And uh, I want to acknowledge the DG of UPU and all the members that are here. Uh, it is indeed a privilege for me to be speaking uh, on behalf of uh, the Pan-African Postal Union. Uh, the Pan-African Postal Union is an African Union specialized agency for postal services. Uh, it has got 45 member states and what I'm speaking to today, uh, trust and security in the post is a very challenging, exciting, and uh, complicated issue. And as you can see, it just came dry like that, trust and security. So the first thing is to contextualize trust and security within the postal sector. And the first thing is for us to have a common takeoff uh, point and uh, agree on what we are talking about when we are referring to the post. Uh, the post is a platform that connects uh, people through exchanges and flows of information, goods and uh, money. And uh, these days we talk of logistics, we talk of uh, digital uh, trade facilitation. And in the context of that, as you know, that uh, the post has been in existence for centuries and over the years, uh, it has managed to uh, gain trust from uh, the uh, consumers, from the uh, partners, and uh, the postal system has always been very secure. But that is a thing of the past. Now we are talking of a, a postal environment which is getting digitalized, uh, which is uh, moving from the traditional post uh, to the uh, smart post office. And this brings with it a number of challenges because the whole industry is moving away from its comfort zone. And my talk today will center on uh, some work which was done by um, some academics and 
these academics uh, produced a paper which was published in a journal in uh, 2020. And uh, in their work, what they spoke about is an indication of uh, uh, what the, the uh, post is uh, in terms of, uh, sorry, what the, the post is in terms of uh, the current uh, ecosystem. This ecosystem uh, speaks to the digitalization and the, the various uh, uh, aspects of digitalization which are embraced within the post. The first and most important issue is that the post has to come up with a digital uh, business model which allows customers to have direct access and also uh, the post has to uh, integrate uh, the uh, digital uh, services right across uh, its various uh, uh, components. As you know, the post is more like a, 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 a factory which has no walls. People can walk from any direction. So therefore, it is important that everyone within the postal uh, uh, channel understands and uh, plays a role in the digital uh, space. And uh, because of this ecosystem, uh, the post is now able to bring in various components like your uh, cloud computing, uh, authentication and fraud detection systems, uh, big data analytics, uh, Internet of Things, uh, smart, smart sensors. And what this does is it creates an environment where now clients or customers can uh, trace their, their items along the, um, uh, the conveyance belt. They no longer need to rely to be given information at uh, a given uh, times. But now they can uh, simply uh, go and uh, 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 check on where their items are. And what this does is it leads to a, a model, a postal model that uh, moves the post from the traditional to this uh, smart post office. And what this is uh, uh, entailing is that there could be interventions at three levels. One is the migration of services from the uh, current traditional to the digital platform. The other is the creation uh, of uh, products that add value. And the last one is uh, the improvement of the current products through value addition so that uh, they are able to uh, move the post to the digital space. In a research which was done by McKinsey in 2020, uh, there are issues that came out from that uh, research. And these issues indicate, one, the fact that uh, there is going to be an increase in the deliveries uh, uh, of uh, e-commerce items in the year 2025. And the other important issue is that 70% of the respondents believe that uh, consumers will use postal apps, which means the post has no option but to move to the digital space. <laughs> and now the, the big question is, how can the post build trust and security in a digitalized environment? Like we said, they have now moved from the traditional space where they were very comfortable to the digital um, environment. And the first is that uh, the post must ensure that digitalization touches everyone within the organization. They should also uh, rely on uh, AI-based technologies to improve productivity. This could be on mail and parcel handling. Uh, it could be on uh, digital, uh, smart digital post boxes. It could be on uh, uh, transport and logistics to calculate uh, the most efficient routes. And also, uh, it could be on the issue of introducing autonomous vehicles, drones, we have seen that. So there are various technologies that uh, uh, the post needs to 
to take on board. And what this would do is that it would improve uh, the business uh, reliability and the use of intelligent uh, estimates for the post to be able to tell uh, in terms of uh, trends, be they seasonal, uh, be they events or parcel uh, volume predictions. And what then this would do is it empowers the customers to be able to predict when their items would uh, uh, be delivered. And uh, the most important area that needs to be addressed is on uh, risk management. Like I said, moving to an unfamiliar environment for the post, which is a digitalized environment, brings in a lot of uh, uh, challenges uh, like cyber attacks and uh, theft of information. There's need for data protection. So all this has to be managed by uh, uh, the, the postal entities. And finally, uh, the last two issues relate to uh, market awareness uh, for the post to have interactive websites where customers can get information and uh, they can also have uh, chatbots where customers can get in there and be given information as to uh, the products, as to where their items are and any other questions that they, they, they could have. And uh, finally, all this has to happen in an environment where um, customer, I mean, uh, where uh, employees are capacitated and trained uh, for a digital uh, readiness. I see my time is up and I would want to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Chavez, um, Seapost International, trust and security for you is of course, uh, when you look also at international business, extremely important. So maybe you can share a bit about what you are doing and how you can establish trust and security through connectivity. You can stay seated, you can go up there yes. to recognize like as to you wish. Up. So how do you move, uh, how do you change the slide? You have to press the, the green, green button. button. It's okay. just the green big button. Okay. <laughs> Good morning all. How are you doing? Uh, first of all, I would like to recognize uh, Mr. Mitoki, DG, and uh, also everyone present. And I'd like to thank UPU for the opportunity um, to speak. For the ones that don't know, Kyoto is a Dutch Caribbean island located just off the coast of Venezuela with a total land area of 444 square kilometers. The population size is about 160,000 inhabitants and the population is multicultural and also multilingual. We speak uh, a minimum of four languages on the island and that is Dutch, English, Spanish and of course our native language called Papiamento. Seapost International is the national postal operator and it has been um, for the last couple of years on a transformative journey to become a modern and trusted postal and logistics service provider. Our vision is to become the regional leader in the Caribbean by providing innovative and client-focused delivery solutions, thus enhancing the business and general public experience. One of the things I learned early in my first business class at the university is that a good sign of a business is repeat customers. The challenge is how do you guarantee a steady flow of repeat customers in today's business environment, whereby customer de de demands are constantly changing. The solution, in my opinion, is very simple, and, and that is to create proven, trusted, and secured postal services. In order to enhance the customer experience, we have developed many payment solutions uh, within um, C-Post. One of them that we are very proud of is, is the self-kiosk um, that we developed and um, to support one of our um, services. And this service is called Punto Mio. It's an online shopping solution whereby customers um, can online um, can um, shop online in the US and also in Europe. Um, their purchases are being shipped to a centralized warehouse managed by one of our partners and subsequently 
The shipments are shipped to Curacao for processing and delivery. In the past, um, uh, even though we have home delivery, the majority of our customers like to go to the post office to retrieve their packages. It was so that uh, in the beginning um, of this uh, service, people would stay or stand in line at least one to 1.5 hours. They would even bring their lunch boxes with them. And in some worst cases, they would leave the post office without um, collecting the packages. So uh, with technology, we have streamlined that business and we introduced the self kiosk whereby the customer can go directly to the, this kiosk, key in their unique customer number, select that they are ready to pick up packages, pay um, for, the, for the packages and retrieve um, the packages at the counter within five to 10 minutes. Now this um, 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 solution has greatly uh, improve, um, improve customer satisfac satisfaction and loyalty for the service. Next to that, uh, we ha have also launched this year a C-Post uh, app whereby a customer can track um, their packages and registered mail, interact with customer service, sign up for different uh, services and even pay, let's say, utility bills via our e-wallet system. The personal interaction through the app resulted in increased convenience and a positive customer reaction. It is no longer necessary to call the customer service if you have inquiry and, and, and to have inquiry and then remain in the queue before talking to a service representative. Thirdly, um, as, uh, as we speak this week, we are in the process of implementing a track and trace software called SmartTrack. And this, uh, we are doing this with our UK partner, partner called One World Express. And this allows businesses that hand um, over mail to us to validate the delivery of their mail piece and packages. And the way they do it, that is by logging into the web portal and then validate the geolocation the e-signature and even a photo proof is that is required. In the following year, we all, will also experiment with smart lockers as a PUDO location. C-Post International is one of the few organi organizations still on the island that accept traditional payment, meaning cash. Right now, the many um, businesses on the island, including banks, um, even government, are closing down their counters because they want to focus on their core business. But in our case, we have uh, four branches, four service centers, and these companies are today looking at us to help them with their payment collection. So we have um, telecom companies, we have utility companies, we have even the government looking at us to help them. And we are um, expanding our kiosk platform. Security in the postal environment and data integrity are crucial aspects for the provision of postal services. Ensuring the confidentiality and reliability of the information during the process is vital to protect both personal and integrity of the overall dat data. Reason why we have implemented um, proactive 24 seven landscape scanning so software to prevent um, hacking attempts. Furthermore, our IT department applies encrypted and secondary authentication methods to ensure um, a safe um, environment on our servers. In conclusion, I can say that trust and security are the cornerstones in the postal industry and are essential factors for the success and growth of any business. We have to continuously invest in advanced technology to ensure that our postal services remain reliable, secure, and trustworthy. Thank you. Perfect, thank you.
Let's now turn to the Asia Pacific Post Cooperative. And I mean, Sid, I mean, the, the objectives, of course, uh, or your mission is to drive innovation, but to also uh, enhance existing solutions uh, to, to drive cross border e commerce among your membership. So, what role does trust and security play, and how do you enable that within your membership? Yeah, thanks. So, um, for those of you that don't know the APP, I thought I'd start this with a, a bit of an introduction as to who we are and what we do. Like a lot of the uh, cooperatives and associations in our industry, this year we're coming into our 30th year of existence. So it was, uh, it was key for me when joining two years ago that we took that 30 years of history, we looked at what our purpose had been, and we decided whether or not that was something we, we should be doing. And at that point, we decided... The past was the past, the future is the future, let's move forward. So we've gone from an organization that was very much focused on basic quality of service building um, to an organization that's now focused on existence of post and therefore the things we need to do as, an, uh, as a group of organizations to change and trust and security underpin that. So whilst there are lots of flowery words in the mission statement, the long and the short of it is that as a cooperative, my job, our, our job is to bring volume back to the posts wherever possible to stop it from losing the volume that it has today and to ensure that we remain relevant in our markets, both uh, across the region as a whole, but in, in, in individual markets. We do that in one of four ways. And, and I was a late comer to this, uh, th this forum. So uh, when the question was asked, you know, how does the APP support trust and security? I can't, my first answer was, I'm, I'm not really sure it does. And then, I kind of, then when you start to think about that in context and you work through what does trust and security really mean, there are, there are lots of different pieces. So, of course, there's data security and there's what we're doing around the world of AI and so forth. But there's actually security of our existence as an industry. There's security and trust in terms of our relationships with one another as posts and entities. So we, we do what we do in four key ways. We focus on commercial growth. I mentioned that just a moment ago. Everything we do should have a, a growth or at least a sustaining element to it for our posts. We do it by uh, customer empowerment. And when we talk about customer empowerment, I'll come to it in a bit more detail later. But some of that is just in sitting down with those groups of customers that our posts want to be working with and finding out what they want from us. It's as simple as, as that, really, at that level. Collective impact, all of those things that as a group impact my posts. I've got 28 posts ranging from in the far uh, west of our territory, Iran, far east would be Vanuatu, uh, north to Mongolia and south to New Zealand. So uh, we cover a huge area uh, and there's actually a lot of commonality across that. And then, of course, because where we started is operational excellence and there's a huge amount of trust and security elements that come into that. So just giving you a a look at the numbers for APP. 28 members, actually we're just about to increase that, I think to 30, which will be nice. Um, give or take in our region something like uh, 4.3 billion people. We cover three or four of the largest population spots on earth and 53 million square kilometers covered by our posts every single day. So I think uh, yeah, Charles and various others mentioned our breadth, our, our reach is phenomenal. Um, Across that, we've got about 1.3 million postal operatives, and, and that number varies depending on which uh, statistics you're looking at, but that's the best I can get to. And some 500,000 post offices and 600,000 third parties. The importance for our region when it comes to growth is that we're responsible for some 65% of all e-commerce volumes that are produced, and we consume almost 60% of those. So as a region, the e-commerce market is particularly important to us, both for external, internationally, and intra-Asia Pacific. And that represents something like a 5.3 uh, billion value to the industry overall, if we were to access it all. So what do we do? Well, we've got uh, the nine core elements of what we do here, and trust and security comes into a good number of these. We now have a, a dedicated research and development data uh, arm within the organization that is working um, really hard to understand what's coming down the road, how we use things like AI, what its implications for members are, both in the competitive landscape and in our more traditional uh, postal world. We have uh, some learning support platforms that are in place to make it easy for members to uh, digest that sort of information and to be able to increase their capacity as operators. 
as I mentioned, the operational excellence pieces. Um, and then we go down into product elements. And some of these I'm going to mention in more detail later. But they are the things that really do underpin the trust elements within our membership. Because for all of these, if you're not able to work in clear, open, trusting frameworks, they don't work. So uh, ePacket, the, mo many of you will know about ePacket. It's been around for a while now. It's our lightweight, low-cost, uh, non-terminal dues tracked packet solution. Uh, and is one of the few, uh, certainly from the data that we're seeing, uh, tracked packet solutions in the market that is still growing its market share. And uh, members are actively out and, and improving on what they're doing. XBR, which is our newly launched DDP solution for post. Now, that came around on the back of conversations about data security and data transacting and how we make sure that our posts can move quickly in the areas that they need to. Uh, and Gateway, which I'm not going to talk about in any detail now, but is coming down the line very shortly and uh, it will be transformative for those members that take part. The bits that really under, underpin for me the, um, the trust elements, the collaborative elements of what we do are the forums, workshops, and our Connect program. So between the forums, that's where we find either smaller groups of members who have commonality across themselves. We have a small islands uh, workshop uh, that, that is completely focused on those things that impact those economies that do not have the breadth of scale effectively. We have workshops where we work on things like data security and learning lessons. For example, we, we had a workshop recently on the lessons learned from the Royal Mail data hack. Um, and they were very graceful in giving us quite a lot of data for that. So it was very nice of them. And then we have a Connect program, which is, I suppose, in, in simple terms, it's the APP's version of the CC, somewhat more operator-focused than intergovernmental, as you can imagine. So we, we exist on one principle. As a group, we are stronger. United, we deliver. And with 28 nations, that's got to be true is the way we look at it. So the, the, the background to that is that we've been talking for 150 years about being a network and we want to be a network, network as a group. So I'm going to try and shoehorn the subject into the presentation now, but what, what do we, oh, so can we go backwards just one? The small red button. It's not. Don't press anything. I'll, I'll do a tap dance in a moment if I need to. Do you want me to just skip forward? Oh, it's tough. I've got another 10 minutes, you poor people. Okay, so shoehorn that in. So how do we affect trust and security in our region? Well, the first is, is leadership. We're not afraid to have the really difficult conversations. So one of those that we've started in recent times is a conversation over remailing, bulk mailing, and what happens when countries come foul of that. We've had some well-publicized issues with that in the Pacific region, uh, and we're working very hard to come up with a framework that enables our posts to avoid the pitfalls of that particular minefield. Uh, security of the industry, so you know, my purpose, our purpose as a cooperative is to ensure that our posts exist in a few years' time. And, and that is the, the, the main reason we're there. That means that we sometimes have uh, ideas that can't go forward. And sometimes we have great ideas that can go forward, but we have a, a bias towards action as a group rather than sitting back and just talking about things. That's, that's the principle of it. Uh, and we advocate and we represent our members uh, on various levels. As I mentioned in the dialogue section, which is, I think, the, the key to both of these subjects, we, we have forums, workshops, and connect. It is all about stakeholder engagement and collaboration, making sure that we understand what is needed, both from our industry intra and from the other industries in, and advocating for that change where it's needed. We're not an intergovernmental organization. We don't get involved in regulation. We do speak to some of the regulators. We have good relationships with a number, but we're not involved in negotiating that. Um, and then at a product level, it's about building a suite of products that's fit for the market and ensures that our members collaborate in a secure way and that helps them to grow and to grow their trust with their customers and with their wider stakeholder groups. So that's a, a, a small input on how we affect trust and security from a slightly different perspective. Um, but I, I hope interesting and happy to take any questions on it. All right, thank you. <clears throat>
when we when we look at trust, um, I remember it was funny yesterday. I had this startup competition, and there was one startup that was kind of reflecting on how the postal industry has changed over time. And so there was an image to the left that showed, okay, black and white image, old, and there was written trust. That was one of the leading principles. And then to the right, there was some fancy new delivery car and there was written speed. So speed has replaced trust. That was kind of the message. And I thought, well, no, <laughs> that's, that's not really true. But what is true is probably that the concept of trust has changed over, over the past few years, in particular when we look at all the different types of new technologies, whether it's AI or whether it's blockchain or whatever it is. So how do you think uh, how, how this impacts the industry, this change of trust or the change of the concept of trust that is simply widening and going into different areas that have not been really so important in the past? Maybe Chief Moya, if you have a few on that. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that uh, uh, very important uh, question and observation. Yes, trust has changed in terms of uh, how it's understood by the customers uh, over the years. You may recall that uh, in the past, when the post was traditional in its approach, uh, it would simply be carrying stuff uh, from people that they don't even know but successfully deliver to people that they don't know. They were just relying on uh, uh, the addresses that are on the items. And the same happened with the financial services. When someone is sending money, he comes, presents himself to the post office, and uh, the post office accepts the money and gets the money delivered to the next person without really knowing these people. But over time, uh, and during that time, the customers would rely more on the information they get from the, the post to say, where is my item, where is my money, and stuff like that. But now, things have changed uh, because of uh, the uh, technological revolution that has happened. People have got uh, information on their fingertips. They can now track uh, items. Uh, the, the post cannot lie to say, your item is stuck at the airport because uh, the, the person will get uh, online and see that, no, this item is actually sitting at the office of delivery. Why? Because of this interconnectedness of uh, uh, systems, the value chain, uh, now you can track your item where it is at any given time. So the issue of trust then means there is need for more transparency, there is need for more involvement of uh, customers, in terms of uh, where their items are and how they are treated. And at the same time, we now have systems that can even uh, detect if what is being carried is uh, something that is illegal. Uh, so all this is helping to build uh, the trust even more because we are having a situation where the uh, operators have to uh, account for their actions and they don't need to uh, show their faces, but the systems speak for themselves. Thank you. Cheers. Yes, um, in my opinion, I don't think that um, um, trust has really changed. I think the underlying principle is the same. And for me, trust is belief. So customer has to continually believe in your service and that's why you have to be consistent in the features that you offered. Okay, of course, um, customers are more demanding um, in these days. But the thing is, you give, you use technology to give them more um, transparency and access to the services they are purchasing from you. So for me, um, trust 10 years ago or, or now, it's the same thing. It's about a set of belief that customers have into the company and the services you offer. So, I, I'm going to have a, some, some extent here. I think, you know, look at our industry, it's an inherently trust-based industry for, you know, whether it be 500 years in the case of uh, the, the Portuguese post office or almost 200 years in the case of some of our, our, our Asian post offices, we, we are based on the principles of, of trust. 
Um, and actually, the anecdotal story over, there's two different stories over, over why the, uh, the first postage stamps came around. The anecdotal story is that one of the prime ministers of the UK upset the population. And back then, you had to pay to receive your letter. So as an act of spite, people started sending him many, many letters. And as they turned up, he had to hand over two pennies each time. Otherwise, he couldn't find out if it was an important letter or a piece of hate mail. And he paid a lot of money for a lot of hate mail and therefore challenged the postmaster general at that point to come up with a solution for paying for your post on delivery. Put the pain in the, the, the hands of the person sending instead. So actually, I mean, you know, when you look at that or the principles of why the UPU was founded back in, in the early days or why we exist today, it's an inherently trust-based uh, uh, um, industry. Added to that, that, and again, I'll use some of our members as examples, our, our longevity in our markets has given us uh, a sort of an ingrained ability to be known by our populations. We, we can lose that trust. And I think you know, that's been proven, as I say, in, in some of our markets, but it's also proven that it's really quite easy with simple changes to win that trust back. So trust underpins what we do. It ha I, I'm with her entirely. It hasn't changed inherently as a factor. There are just other things we need to bring into to play in the modern world. The basics are simple. Provide a service that people are willing to use, trusting of, proud of as a uh, as a nation and, and understand, I think, from a post's perspective, what your core roles are for the nation that you serve. Um, and actually at that point, pretty much people are on board with you. Okay, thank you. I look to the audience. Are there any questions for our panelists here? Then let me pick up on, on one point. <clears throat> Uh, we, we, we discussed the involvement maybe of trust over time and found that there isn't really, the, the principal concept is the same. Um, but maybe, I mean, you, you all three come from three different regions as well. And, uh, and there might be differences also in culture or in regions, how you perceive trust, for example. So what are the expectations, for example, from the different societies in perceiving trust or towards trust and also security? How, how do you think is that are there differences and if so how can how can it be possible to create this you want maybe universal or global concept of trust since we are talking here about a global kind of network <laughs> it plays a role maybe jealous you want to start um yes if we look at the the team uh, which was um, issued by the dg this year on um, world postal day if I recall well, it says connected by trust and collaborating for a safe and secure environment. I think that is um, very important because for the longest time, post offices have played a, wrong, a role around the world by connecting um, communities and even countries. Um, in Curacao, um, Curacao, as I explained, is a very, um, not a very, it's a small island in the Caribbean. And in our case, we have to, or we strive to deliver every time um, in order to meet the expectation of the customers. Because since it's a small island, if we don't do, if we don't perform, the word of mouth, and especially nowadays with social media, Instagram, and Facebook, they start complaining on these platforms and we have to quickly react um, to these, let's say, sometimes uh, accusations by the customer. So um, it's very, very challenging for us operating in a very, uh, uh, in a very small community. But that's why I mentioned uh, previously, it's good to be consistent at all times. So I, I have the privilege of representing Asia Pacific, but I'm quite clearly not Asian. Yeah, I come from the UK. Um, I, I don't know what gives it away, but um, yeah, I, I come from the UK, and, and I have the, the, the remarkable privilege of, of representing 28 extraordinarily diverse posts. Um, but I, but actually, there are huge commonalities in what underpins that trust in the postal network. It, whether it be Royal Mail in the UK, 
uh, I'm going to signal Charles out because he's here, but post Malaysia, it, you know, over in Malaysia, or, or even you know, China Post or, or, or one of our Pacific Island nations. It, it does come down to that consistency and it comes down to the way that you deal with people. So, as I say, I'm going to signal uh, post Malaysia out, but be, pri primarily because they've, what they've done in recent times underpins pretty much the standard for what's needed in terms of uh, gaining and keeping the trust of your of your uh, your customers. So, you know, from a from what we see, Charles' perspective, um, and, and I'm lucky that I get a, a good a good window in on uh, post Malaysia. What's what's happened is there's been a, a distinct change in the approach to dealing with those things when they're problems, and to being open about the issues that are there, and telling people what you're doing to. To fix that now, you know, Asia Pacific being what it is, we have some countries where you need to be a little bit more direct, some countries where you need to be a little bit subtle. But the, the thing that actually is common is honesty. Nobody at all minds that a problem happens so long as you deal with it in the right way. Um, and, and, and again, fourth time I'm going to mention his name, but you, know, you, you can go on LinkedIn and watch people complain about post Malaysia, and they do. You know, and, and sometimes it's fair and sometimes it's unfair. But the one person who tends to respond is Charles as the group CEO. Now, how many of our CEOs across the postal world would do that directly? I think he's nuts for giving out his mobile number, but he does it. Um, and, and, and it has a, you, you can see immediately the switch in perception. You care. It's not even, you know, I'm sure Charles passes it to someone else to deal with, and, and, and of course he should. Um, but the reality is that that person goes from combative and complaining to actually you do care about my one item that went missing or went wrong or whatever. And, and, and you see that in many of our posts. Now, not so many are good at maybe talking about it, but um, you see that, uh, that standard of acceptance of honesty and willingness to work with you to fix problems having a massive impact across all, all of the posts that I'm aware of. Uh, and so I think you know, that, that element of trust is, is look, we, we exist. We've been here for a long time. We've done really good things for the country over a period of time. At points, we've not been so great. Today, we didn't do so well. But this is what we're going to do to fix it for you. And if you work from that basis, actually, trust is really easy to maintain. Really easy to maintain. Mm -hmm. I can add to, uh, also to that is, um, in case uh, when we have, um, let's say, customer complaints, either on Facebook or even on the radio, what I will do, um, I will personally call that person, apologize for the inconvenience, uh, inconvenience cost, and in that way, I reestablish the trust within the post office. So um, most of the times, customers are surprised that the CEO would call them, and, and then they will also confirm that they will continue to use the postal service just by the mere fact that you have called them. Yeah, I, 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 I think there's a, there's a few points at play here. Our history is massive, I've said that already. The way that we interact with our customers is different to every other industry in the world. We are pretty much the only industry other than the healthcare industry that has a direct relationship with everyone we deal with. We turn up at their doorsteps. We've got post offices. We've got physical infrastructure in the way of post boxes and now, nowadays parcel uh, lockers and shops and you know, keep going. You know, but, we, we, but we are present in the life of the people that we serve every single day. So one of the messages I give to our CEOs when they're talking about wanting the volume from Lazada and wanting the volume from all these big platforms is remember that they're a consumer first. Give them a damn good service at the doorstep. Show them how good we are. Show them the that things do go wrong. Of course they do. It does in all logistics circumstances, and Post is not individual to that. But the, when Post gets it wrong, Post is able to own up to its mistakes and fix them. That, that individual relationship that each of us has with our Posts and that those people have with our Posts is really key to underpinning why we should continue to exist in a broad framework that we have done for a long time. Yes, uh, thank you. I represent a region that uh, has um, uh, 55 countries, but uh, the members that belong to Papua are 45. And uh, when you look at these members, uh, in terms of level of development, they are quite different. Um, and when you look at the uh, population distribution, 
uh, it's also different. We have almost 60-65% in uh, rural areas and uh, the remainder in urban centers. And also, yeah, you look at the whole population, African population, it's a young population. And again, that uh, uh, determines to what extent the issue of trust is going to be followed up. Uh, you know, in a globalized environment like we are in now, uh, people have access to technology. They can check what is happening anywhere and everywhere. And if they have complaints, they can uh, express them. And so what uh, this then presents, uh, like I said before, is there is more need uh, for transparency. There is more need for accountability. But the, uh, the bottom line in terms of trust, it's, it's not changed because uh, uh, what the people want is the customer wants to send an item and it gets received at a given time in a given condition and violated. If they are sending money, it has to be received by the correct person. And uh, uh, all this uh, uh, then brings us back to the issue of saying uh, all these technologies they are meant to facilitate the processes of uh, service delivery, but the bottom line in terms of what trust is has not changed. Uh, the, the postal system has to continue to, to have integrity and uh, serve with honest so that uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, the customers can have faith in the, in the system. But like my colleagues have uh, alluded to, the technologies that are available are making uh, the, the processes to be more transparent, more visible, and without really um, uh, people operating in, in, in darkness. Thank you. Thank you. Look again to the audience. Any, please, there's a question over here in the middle, right in the middle. And a question then in the back as well. Hi, um, good morning. Uh, my name is Blaise Francisco. I'm a strategy manager for PostNL. I'm going to ask a question as a consumer. I'm originally from Southeast Asia, as you can see. Um, uh, one of the things that we see quite heavily in Southeast Asia right now is the growth of, um, um, is the growth of startups in last mile delivery and usually they take advantage of the uh, gig economy, right? And from what I see every time I visit, um, there, the trust compared to the postal system is rather much higher. So I guess my question is, how do you see postal companies from, from all of your regions react to these, to these challenges? Because especially some of these uh, um, organizations are, are, are um, uh, digital natives and uh, it's quite interesting to see, uh, especially for my home country, what's the future for them in the face of this uh, particular pressure. I think this doesn't only concern now uh, Asia Pacific, but you were referring to it, but I think it can re refer to really all three regions, so whoever wants to go first from an APAC perspective yeah. first. Um, and and I, I, the lights are too bright, so I, I, I can't really see your face, but I, um, can I ask which country you're from? Which, okay, fine. I, I could have guessed on an accent, but I wasn't going to do it just in case. Um, so, so, yeah, we've swapped regions. Yeah, you're, you're over here and I'm over there. Um, and, you, and you're right. Look, yeah, actually, the, I was interested rather than it makes a difference because the, the, the circumstances with the startups is pretty much the same, in, certainly in all of the ASEAN nations, I think would be the easiest way to look at it. So uh, we have companies that are effectively not logistics companies, they are tech companies coming in and starting up really easily and on low cost, lightweight models and, and stealing the volume out from under the post's um, feet. Is it trust? Well, more often than not. No, not to start with, it's price. They buy the, they buy the volume. Um, do they do a good job? in the areas that they can. Yeah, on the whole, they do, they're, 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 you know, their service is reasonable. Do they give half of that mail back to my posts? Well, 22% roughly over ASEAN, they give back to our posts because they can't 
possibly hope to deliver in those areas that we have zero choice but to go to because we hold that universal service obligation. So there's an element that I think our posts on a, on a uh, commercial level should actually talk about that a little bit more, should make it clear that Ninjavan, as a good example, cannot deliver to half of the Philippines, cannot get to most of, uh, of um, the, the non peninsular part of Malaysia easily, and certainly can't cover all 17,800 Indonesian islands in the way that Indonesia post, uh, post Indonesia have no choice to do. So that, that trust is bought, in my opinion, on the whole. It's not, it's not longevity of trust that we have within post. Um, and, and I think that as we see those companies and they come and they go, that's the, uh, actually it's the bit that I like most about them to some degree, because they kind of prove they're not so trustworthy by disappearing reasonably quickly. Um, Ninja's a, a, an example, uh, an, a, a bad example of that maybe, but there are plenty that have come and gone. Um, I think to some degree they actually underpin why trust in post is, is, is uh, both institutionally there already and, and important. We exist, we have, a, we have an absolute mandate to exist. It isn't a choice thing. Yeah? Our government set us up at some point, they may have privatised us, they may have not, but they still insist we do our job and they still insist that we deliver to absolutely everyone. So. Um, are they a danger? Yes. Do they, are they trustworthy? Uh, I won't say they're not trustworthy. Do they have long-term trust? No, not at the moment. And until their model changes, it's not hugely investment-driven and therefore buying market share. They can't hope to. That's, that's the truth. So with a lot of my, my posts, the, the, the answer to what do we do about these platforms is hold your nerve. You know, yes, look, we need, to, we need to evolve, we need to change our pricing models, our, our service models, our data quality, so on and so forth. But hold your nerve because they're not going to all be around for very long. And, and actually, when we come out of it, and we will at some point, we'll be proven to be the ones that carried on doing that job in the way that we always have. Better, worse, standard, you know, but the trust will still be there in us, whereas they'll, they'll prove their case wrong. Yeah. Uh... Thank you very much. I think uh, in, in Africa, um, because of uh, the universal service obligations, which are weighing down on uh, the operators, and also the lack of uh, investment to recapitalize the, uh, the designated operators, you find that the quality may be compromised. And uh, because of that, there is a gap which is observed by uh, startups. They come in and try and fill in that gap. But uh, this is not a short race. This is a marathon. Like my colleague has said, they come in because they are seeing a mirage. They believe ah, there's an opportunity we can fill in this gap, but uh, they would not have understood the nuts and bolts of uh, the industry, the key success factors. And because of that, uh, they would not last the distance. So yes, the perception that they create is that uh, they can do it better, but uh, it's only a matter of time before they pack, before they abandon the mission. And the, 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 the traditional um, uh, players uh, will last the distance. And why um, has the post survived over uh, these centuries is because they keep adjusting the way they do their things. Uh, right now, when we talk of uh, uh, digital solutions, they have embraced them. And going forward, that will not be a, a competitive edge for, for the startups. And so you find that this uh, trust, which has been earned uh, over centuries, over decades, will continue to be um, emphasized uh, and cemented. And uh, thus, uh, my, my belief is that, uh, yes, they can come in. Uh, competition is, uh, is good. Everyone needs to, to be tested. But uh, the postal operators, as we have them, uh, still have uh, that trust which uh, uh, they've earned over the years. Thank you. Yes, um, um, 
the big thing today is to do business um, in Asia. But uh, I must say, especially we, with startups, you have to be very, very, very careful. I think you have to first check the background of the people behind of the company. Because in our case, uh, we spent two years negotiating with the company, negotiating rates and contracts. And at the end of the day, they bypass us and went directly um, to the postal operator. So um, but because of that, we have developed an e-wallet system whereby if customer wants to do business with us, they would deposit money in the wallet and they will uh, retrieve or it, the, the, the deposit will be diluted as, they, as we ship on their behalf. So it was a bad experience, but at the same time it became a good experience because we have developed a new service. And, and it's, all, it's all about trust. I mean, you have to be careful who you dine with. So um, that's my message. Thank you. There was a question over there. Yeah, hello. Great session so far. Thank you for it. My name is Santosh Gopal. I'm CEO of Ship to Mighty and also part of the Considerity Committee. In my view, when it comes to post, the trust comes in two elements. One is in the data. One is the trust on transaction. So they are two different elements. And today, if you look at the private players, that's one of the biggest challenges what they're facing because they're not able to validate the consumers with KYC. They may not have access to the government IDs. And I think the trust and uh, security could be a differentiator which actually will make people think to work with post services more. I'd like to hear if there are, what are the plans of using this challenge as an opportunity to create a differentiator for post offices? Yes, I can um, give an example of that. Um, we have a service uh, within the post office called print and mail, hybrid mail, whereby um, companies would um, digitally um, send their um, batch, their invoices to us, and we will print these invoices, envelope them, and distribute them, okay? And we have... Um, uh, deal with a local company that is a supplier of printers. And this um, client specifically asks that whenever we receive the batch, within, as soon as the batch finish the printing of the letters, it will directly um, delete all the information. So that's how you um, um, give trust um, to, in this case, any, any, any businesses that want you to do business is by using the power of technology, in this case, the printer capacity to delete all the information. Mm -hmm. If you want to react yeah. as well. I mean, I, 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 uh, having spent a lot of time talking with Santosh, I, I understand where, uh, where his question comes from. And certainly, you know, in terms of what the cooperative is doing, uh, we're, we're looking at utilizing some of the work that's been done at the CC's level to enhance that security of data for our members and, and for their, um, their, their populace. Across Asia Pacific, you've got a really, uh, a really uh, diverse breadth of um, government involvement with things like digital ID and so on. In Singapore, we're completely online for all that sort of stuff. You, you can't do a single thing without having your sing pass. It, it, it's on your phone and it's on, yeah, and it's with you the whole time. Uh, and then there are some countries that haven't even got basic ID for, the, for yeah, just get, getting along. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a tough one. But I think, I think if we work from the premise that we, we've always had a bit of a pri privileged space in the world as posts. So, you know, we're, we're the only industry with a, a, a UN specialized agency set up for it. And actually, you know, lovely though that is, we're a commercial industry. You know, no, no other one has that. So if you work from that premise and the fact that our job is to serve the public, um, to give them access to communications, and nowadays, of course, that's parcels rather than letters, but to give them uh, all of those things in a, in a curated and easy to use way, regardless of who you are, where you are. Then, then underpinning the ability to do that, and I think uh, Chief mentioned uh, items stuck in customs and so on uh, earlier on, and how you release those, and, and what, what that, that um, security of data 
looks like is really, really important. The thing to remember, and this is, uh, this is something that I've been cautioning within the cooperative, but also within my conversations with uh, the, the UPU and IPC and various other agencies, is that a one size fits all approach fits no one. Yeah, everything needs tailoring to that geography, to that group of customers, and even within a country, within a geography, there are subsets of customers that it needs tailoring for. So um, I, I, I fully support the work that's being done with uh, uh, Santosh and the CC, and, and I know that uh, uh, Chief and Papu are on board with that as well. We're following the example of Papu in that, but, I, but my caution would be that as, a, uh, as an industry, our historic approach of one size fits all is probably at its end. And we need to be far more conscious that whilst the principles may be similar, the application is vastly different. Yeah. You want to react as well? Yeah. Uh, th thank you very much. I think when it comes to a data protection, um, these, the approaches are different from uh, country to country. But uh, what we are having at the moment is an attempt by our regulatory authorities to harmonize uh, these uh, uh, laws so that uh, uh, data protection of uh, customer uh, or personal information is, is the same as standard uh, as items move from one country to another uh, or through uh, uh, one country. So, uh, yes, at the moment, regulatory authorities and governments are seized with the issue of enhancing uh, data protection, uh, more so because as we move uh, to digital economies where there is plenty of uh, information that is floating, which needs to be secured, then there is need for a uh, for, uh, uh, approach that would, at the end of the day, ensure that uh, a customer's information is uh, protected. And uh, for the post, the majority of uh, 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 postal operators in Africa that are moving to um, uh, marketplaces or creating their e-commerce platforms, they are uh, uh, gradually uh, gravitating towards the use of uh, dot post and uh, I don't think I need to lecture you the advantages that you get from dot post. Uh, it's secure, it's always being um, developed to ensure that uh, uh, hackers do not uh, access uh, uh, information uh, uh, for uh, consumers and at the same time financial information for, for the organization. So uh, at the end of the day, it is the choice uh, of the infrastructure that the operator would go for, which would ensure that uh, the security of the data in their custody is guaranteed. And uh, that way, the trust that they have earned or that they want to earn uh, is, 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 is ach uh, achieved. And so I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fluid process. Uh, because we are, we are getting into unfamiliar uh, territory. Like I said before, the post is moving to unfamiliar territory, but once they master their game there, there is no going back. Thank you. We have one more question over here. I, I think we, we are running out of time, and I would even ask you to, to ask this question only to one of the three panelists, if possible. Okay. Um, my name is Mundo Gusterpikis. I am... Uh, Managing Economist and the Head of Postal and Delivery Service at Copenhagen Economics. And as an economist, um, my question is on the link between trust and universal service obligation. It was mentioned, I think, in the panel, you, some of you mentioned the universal service obligation. And in Europe, we have a lot of discussion about the financial uh, pressure that USO creates on postal operators. I'm wondering, in your regions, um, how do you see that link between trust and universal service obligation, and how do you expect it to evolve in the future? Who shall answer? Uh, Moya. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, in Africa, universal service obligation 
he is the elephant in the room. Why? Uh, the post is a developmental institution that the government is using to roll out various programs, be it uh, uh, social uh, uh, payment schemes, uh, be it uh, uh, making sure that women access uh, funding through the post or the youth programs. So th the government would want to see uh, the post offices operating even in areas that are not profitable. Uh, that's on one hand. On the other hand, the operator uh, is not keen uh, because, as you know, you may want to. The, the, the spirit may be willing, but uh, it's the, the financial capacity uh, that will determine whether you'll be able to do so or not. And at the end of the day, there is a compromise. Uh, if it's uh, mail delivery, then maybe uh, frequencies are reduced from daily to once a week and sometimes once in two weeks. And um, then you find that uh, uh, to some extent, uh, trust may not be uh, seriously injured, but it will be eroded. Why? Because uh, the people who are expecting their items, if they're in rural areas, they know that uh, their mail comes twice a, a week or three times a week. But now when it comes once, every week or every two weeks, then uh, they start getting worried to say, is everything okay? Uh, or we are not going to receive our items. So yes, there is a, a trade-off, uh, or should I say there is a link between trust and universal service obligation. But at the same time, from a government point of view, from policymakers' point of view, they are comfortable that at least the service is still there, at least the post office is still operational and maybe the time will come when the rains would fall and uh, there will be harvest and then the post office will continue to, uh, to operate in a, in a more uh, predictable manner. Very, very last question, but a short question to one panelist again, please. <laughs> Thanks, Bernard, and I'm sorry if I'm keeping people up from lunch. Uh, Siva Somersundram from the International Bureau of the Secretariat. Um, I just want to pick up on the previous question that was raised by a colleague from Post NL because it left a, a rather discordant note with me in terms of the responses, um, mainly because we've been sort of keeping track of um, the way in which startups and some of these, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I wouldn't say fly and fly out, but entities that are in the marketplace targeting last mile delivery, particularly in the metropolitan areas because that's where the money is and so on and so forth. And, and I thought it was quite interesting that each of the three uh, panelists seemed to think that the post would survive this. I just, at the back of my mind when I was thinking this through, uh, I couldn't help but draw the comparison with what's happening with um, financial transfers, financial services in particular, um, where the post uh, traditionally in the case of domestic money transfers and to some extent the international money transfers, has had a, a, a trust premium, uh, well-known uh, network, and so on and so forth. But increasingly, uh, in many countries, uh, it's the, uh, the fintech companies, the startups, who are making significant inroads in, into that market space, and posts are struggling. Um, so if you, so what's the difference? Uh, we, we had the same features in terms of trust, reach and network, um, perhaps a, a, a bit more regulated industry in the case of financial services um, and, and, and not last mile delivery in metropolitan areas. But, you know, I, I think if we're not careful, you're going to have a situation that could be quite similar. Thank you. Um, I think, Sid, you want to answer, so. Yeah, I, 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 maybe if I can pick <laughs> this up. Um, so, uh, let me start with saying, uh, Severin, you know me well enough to know that I'm, I am not blindly positive about our industry. Um, in fact, it, you know, I started a speech in KL a couple of weeks ago with, uh, you know, post is dead, long live the post. Uh, and what I mean is that um, what we have always been has got to change. Okay. So when I, when I say that, you know, hold your nerve, you, you'll still be there. I, d I don't mean <laughs> don't do anything. Yeah, because because let, let, let's face it. We, we, when you look at the the competition that we're dealing with, they're more agile, 
They're more capable of being uh, you know, cost effective. They're certainly more aggressive in the way they go about doing things. And they're not encumbered with the regulations and, um, and, and, and at times glacial pace that we can work at. And let's be really blunt about this. But we do have an opportunity to change as a industry. And we have a, we have a huge amount of potential behind us that we do not have to go and find. It is already there. The analogy I would use and I use regularly is back in the days when Netflix came around. They were sending out uh, DVDs in the post and their, their major competitor in the market was Blockbuster. And uh, the only difference between the two industries at that point, the two companies at that point, was that Blockbuster charged fees for being late and Netflix didn't. And the CEO of, of Blockbuster went to his board and said, I really think we should drop late fees because you know, these guys are coming up quickly. And the board said, but that's 9% of our profit. We, we're not dropping late fees. We'll lose 9% of our profit. Two years. Two years later, they lost their whole company to protect 9% of, our, of their profit. So look, you know, the same is true for Post. We, we, we fundamentally have to change. And I would say almost every factor we are, we're not great on data at the moment. We're shocking on price overall. The, uh, certainly on an international level, the product range is confusing at best for customers. It does not work for most people unless they have to use it at a consumer level. At a company level, it's worse than that. There are so many people coming after my volume. Why do I need to go to the post? One of the biggest complaints I get is I've tried to speak to your posts and they don't talk back. We're not sales organizations on the whole. So much has got to change. So this is not me saying, yeah, post is perfect. We're, we're guaranteed to be around for another 200 years. Actually, I think we've probably got five to 10 years if we don't change of, of the dominance that we have. Well, we haven't got the dominance anymore, but of the position that we've had. But we, we have a fundamentally sound base to do that from. The question and, um, and, and Siva, you've been our chair in the past, so you're, you're aware of the challenges we have at, at APP. The question I ask of my posts is, is really simple. We get the commercial people in the room, they want to make the changes. It's when it goes back and you get the policy people involved and the, the old way of post working that things slow or stop. How do we allow the two to work hand in hand, the policy, the regulation, backing up the things we do quickly, agilely to, to change the market. And at the moment, I don't think that's there. That's, I think that's possibly one of our largest challenges. Our regulators need to allow us to be more agile. The UPU is trying really hard to underpin some of that work as well as our IPC, us, various other entities. Um, I think the days of doing that in isolation are gone. We need to come together as a group and actually make stuff happen. Um, so it isn't a blindness to the challenges. I just think that, the, and, and I genuinely believe that the, the longevity we have had as an industry and the, the history that therefore underpins that trust is the thing that we need to remember and hold on to whilst fundamentally transforming the business model at the same time. Um, and, and I'll just finish by saying we've got posts in our region that are actively talking about reducing their USO. And my, my caution on that is always, do not reduce your USO, change it. It is not, you know, the universal service obligation, we all know this, it's not universal. It's different in each country and in each territory. It's run differently. But the one thing it does guarantee that is, is that I can get to everyone and everywhere. So to take uh, Chief's point, reduce the frequency in certain areas, fine, but do not reduce what you're offering because it's the one thing, the, probably the only thing actually, that gives you the edge over every single competitor in your country and region. Givoy wants to also react to you, but then we really have to stop. Please go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I, I, I wanted to make uh, the observation that uh, the post operates in a number of uh, sub-sectors. So uh, startups can f come into an area where the post is not very good, uh, but there are areas where uh, they will not find it easy. And at the end of the day, again, it's an issue of strategic uh, positioning of the post. Uh, how do they treat startups? How do they treat competition? Do you always have to go head on or you need to 
uh, find a way of cooperating and working together. I'll give an example of uh, a, a financial services in Kenya where the M-Pesa came uh, into play, a mobile service uh, uh, money transfer, and uh, you find that this uh, service caught fire in the, uh, uh, the rest of East Africa, Southern Africa, and a lot of uh, these countries uh, simply moved on to that. And post offices that uh, uh, were forward-looking then got into partnerships with these institutions. It's how they utilize uh, their network presence to their own advantage and also to benefit uh, uh, these new entrants in a win-win kind of situation. Thank you. Yours, <laughs> but yes, very, yes. very short. <laughs> I just want to finish on a positive note. Please. I think uh, we have to, uh, the ones that work in the postal industry, especially the postal organization, we have to be extremely proud of our network. I had the pleasure two weeks, three weeks ago to be in Richard um, in Saudi Arabia. And one of the things that we were discussing is opening the market, okay, for the wider sector postal players. Now you have to ask yourself, if these companies didn't have confidence in us and trust, why are they knocking at the doors of UPU to be part of it? This means that they perceive us as a trusted and secure um, postal organization and network. So we are stronger um, than we think that we are and we should leverage on that mere fact, combine our forces and capabilities with the private sector and then um, fortify the universal uh, service obligation. Just thank you very much for this really positive end note here, because after SIT I was really scared a bit. I mean, I was hoping for a positive end note and you crushed it a bit. But I, Travis, I, I, thank I, you very I, much. You saved, you saved the panel here. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much to all the three panelists. Give them a big applause. We are running a little bit late, but uh, of course, that was, uh, the, it's the fault of Siva who asked the last question. I'm sure you all agree with that. So thank you very much. We'll be back here at uh, 2 o'clock in one and a half hours. Thank you.